Well, I'm gonna whoop Dibby ass. I I just seen this shit. This is motherfucking die bomb. Anyways, what's going on with us? Your boy Abby Game James underscore thirty six. And I don't mess with people who don't have hairlines uh, when I'm in foreign countries. So I'm gonna let my dog Dibby live until I get back to the United States. Then I'm gonna terrorize his ass. But um, Den Media Group presents something special. Everybody's been asking, and I normally don't do any Jaguars talk except for on First Coast News. But one of the things that as a guy who travels and gets a chance to do more discussions on them, um, I figure I need to implement that as well as the NFL. So I made a promise to my dog, Big Sarge, we're going to do an AFC South roundtable. I got that. I stole the idea from a radio station I don't really talk about no more. Um, I ain't going to lie to it, but it was old and white. And I figured we could do the exact same thing with seasoning. Nothing wrong with old and nothing wrong with all white, but – even mashed potatoes need salt, pepper, and a little bit of gravy to make sure it got the right amount of seasoning. And it just can't have all of that. But um, there's a lot that's going on with the Jaguars. I've never been a fan of some of the stuff you guys have heard me outspoken. Probably the most um, positive that you've ever heard me on for the Jaguars has been this past season. And normally the people who are a little bit more positive are a little bit more negative, rightfully so, because there's a lot of that to critique. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to bring an OG into the game. Um, probably without him, I probably wouldn't have this job. He walked so I could run, or whatever the fuck you say with those things. But like, he said some outrageous stuff, enough outrageous stuff to get the palate ready for me to be able to come on there, come on radio, and say things like, um, "OBJ might be a fairy, but that fairy can ball, and I don't care who splitting you into or who you splitting into, as long as you score touchdowns." So he helped me be able to say these kind of things. So I'm going to bring on and excuse the chest here. I'm, I'm, out, I'm out of the country, so you got to show you. you got to, I got to get a tan, so I'm about to go to the beach in the spa after I leave here. But I'm going to bring on my guy, um, Anthony Wiggins. You guys know him on Twitter as – or you know him as T-Wig. He's shop talking wig on Twitter. Uh, I don't know what his IG is, but it's something. And then I'm also going to bring up um, another one of my good friends that I've been – you've seen him on the channel, Travis Holmes. Um, rights for Big Cat Country, and we're just going to talk a little bit about the Jacksonville Jaguars and what's going on. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, on Twitter, social media, make sure you guys um, check out um, both of these guys because um, they both have a lot of great things to say about and, very, and a lot of knowledge. A lot of people, they can't say this, but I can. A lot of people don't know what the fuck they're talking about when it comes to sports. It's like kind of like uh, Floyd Mayweather, uncle. Most people don't know shit about this. Most people don't know nothing about football. But these guys are actually two people that I actually enjoy good in their opinion. And I may have stole their ideas. May or may not. Can't do nothing about it, but I like what they say. So I'm going to bring up T-Wig, and then I'm going to bring up Travis, and then I'm going to try to figure out how to do this thing to where, yeah, I don't want anybody to see like that. I don't care about that. No, no, no. All right, this one works better. I thought it did. There we go. We'll, we'll go with that. What's going on, gentlemen? How y'all doing today? What's happening? Hey man, I'm doing well. I'm feeling good. I just, just got out of court. It's crazy. I was in a deposition. Man, you was at a deposition last week when I told you to come on my show. What did what you into? What you got hey, going on? Hey, you know what my old job used to be? I used to be a manager at, over, over an insurance company. So oh, they okay. always got questions. All right. All right. That'll that'll be it. First of all, thank you for having me, James. Thanks for your kind words, uh, big game. And uh, I feel overdressed. So I was gonna suggest that I take my shirt off too, but uh, I don't know. Nobody don't want to see no gray taco meat. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wrong, man. I took I put on a shirt thinking I was gonna be you know, you know underdressed, and then this yeah. man comes out with yeah, with, with the chest hair out. With the- no, that's only on Sundays. It's not Sunday, and it's I'm not on first those news. I will throw on a suit on a Sunday, yeah. <laughs> but nah, I'm good, man. Deposition, boy, I hate them things. I hate lawyers because I, I've been through the deposition process, and I wanted to fight the dude, but um. Hmm. You know, but it's all good. It, they frown upon it. It typically doesn't go very well if you punch somebody in a deposition. But, no, it doesn't. But, but, but yeah. So as I told the people, you know, T-Wig has um, probably one of the more um, influential Jaguar podcasts, Locked On Jaguars, uh, where he does um, every day, which is incredible. I don't want to talk about anything every day. But that's how knowledgeable he is, that he can get us to tune in and listen to his podcast. So make sure you check that out on the YouTube if you're a part of the media group or you're watching this on social media, on the Twitters, um, Travis, you guys have seen him do like a, about a minute, sometimes a little bit longer on the Jags um, right before last season. Um, but he also writes for Big Cat Country. And I've seen both of these guys um, doing something that takes a lot more work than just clicking the button. 
Like, I don't know if y'all realize how hard it is to draft. It gives you a new, even if you think your GM sucks, which is nothing wrong with it, because everybody's, that's why they get paid a lot of money. They get paid the money for the critique, which I don't understand the sensitivity. If, if you were getting paid minimum wage, I get it. You millions of dollars, somebody's going to critique you, but go try to do a draft. Even if you follow college football, like I do, I don't know half of these people's names, and I ain't drafted them, and then even you have to not be a homer, even though the other reason why I like them is because I get to I get to be a homer without having done the work. Because Travis keeps drafting people that I like. Right. I want to see he drafted the corners that I want to see. So um T Wig, before we get I'm gonna give both of y'all ask the question and both of y'all answer it. We'll start with T Wig first. Kind of summarize this bulky era and move and where we've gotten to and really what your opinion is of him as a GM and his Jaguars in the last couple of years. Uh, that's that's interesting uh, that you asked that uh, because it hasn't been terrible. I, if you listen to me talk about it, it, it would sound like that it's terrible. But I, but I tell you why it's, it's like that, James. I haven't changed much from when Dave Caldwell was the GM, and you know this personally. Dave, a friend of mine, but we became Dave, friends yeah. because of my criticism. His subsequent approaching me, he was with his wife, and I was with my wife, and we were at a J Fund event, and. I ain't back down. I stood. I stood firm, as, as the young one say, ten toes in. That's what I did, and I told him. Yeah, I Can I interrupt you real yeah. quick about Go ahead. since we talk about this? So I've been talking a little since, and I talk bad about Jax a lot. Yeah, and then I had never met Dave until uh, my boy got the job at Bowls with Lacrosse, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm over here, and I, and a guy comes up to me and says, "Hey man, I know who you are, man. You play with New Orleans." He's like, "Um." Uh, we thought about bringing you up to Indianapolis. He's like, you do a good job. My son talks about you. I'm like, who are you? He's like, oh, I'm Dave Carl. I was like, oh, D1 Dave is your son. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, all right. So I ran the hell out of this son. Yeah. And he was like, why did you do this? I said, because my life would have been different. I might not be here if I'd have been the damn fullback of the Indianapolis Colts. Should have told you dad made the right. So he's been making bad decisions. For quite some time, I joke so with him all the time about the bad decisions he makes. That boy is so petty. Yeah, <laughs> but the the thing is, is he didn't take it personally. In fact, he even went so far as to say that I was right about a lot of the things that I said, and I was wrong. And he said because you don't know what led to the decision. So I always temper everything that I do and say, even about Trent Balky, because I don't know what leads to the decision. I don't know the, the, the conversations that he's having with Doug. I don't know the input. However, I do know what people who are close to the situation have told me, people that have left and people that are close to the situation that have told other people that ended up telling me. And James, you may know some of the people, you know, we won't we mention names on here, but where the functionality of it all kind of makes it frustrating. Like when they don't, go in the direction you want them to go in and your livelihood depends on them going in that direction and realizing it was correct and then they go another way that doesn't work and then Trent says something like this well I don't want to talk about the past there is no job on earth where you don't talk about your recent decisions that you just made for instance um standing up and hiding behind the truth in plain sight and saying we're not a physical football team. We're not big and physical enough. It's all good and it's all fine because you said something that everybody else already knew. But here's the thing that I want to know. You built it. Why isn't it more big and physical when you're the traits guy? So you can't hide behind that. And that's like telling your mama, yeah, I jumped up, on the, up and down on the bed and I broke your bed frame. I want to own it. You're still going to get that whooping. You you did something you weren't supposed to do. So by not looking back, that's the part that actually bothers me is when it's almost like I'm going to be accountable, but not really. And, and that's the thing for me that I just don't get. How can you stand up and say a team is not big and physical and you're the, and then at the combine, because I almost gave him a mulligan. I'm like, so are, are you saying that because you had to fire a strength and conditioning coach that you wanted? that something in the program is going wrong. And he said, no, nah, the strength and condition of the program is fine. And then he goes to the combine and he says this, guys aren't made big and strong. They're born that way. So I go right back to the old thing. If you're vetting these players, why on earth can your center not lift 
It looks like he can't lift the 45, uh, like uh, one Cadillac on each side of a, of a bench. So my problem is I go back to the person that is in, is supposed to make this team big and physical. He's failed at it, and no one is holding him accountable for it. Wow. Fair enough. Trav, the same question. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think we just kind of nailed it on this. Like, at, at the end of the day, what was your vision when you were building this team? I mean, like, And that's the core question. That's the core question that we all have to talk about. So to say I'm not going to go back and I'm not going to relitigate the past, I'm not going to kind of rehash these situations, I'm not going to tell you about what medical or what this or what off the field issues came about in our investigation, fine, cool. But if I'm going to give you credit when you hit or if you when you lands on some on those picks in 2021, then I, you don't get all the smoke when you miss on multiple rounds straight in 2022, 2023, whatever the case. Like we got that's a hey with with the pros come the cons. I'm sorry, that's kind of how this game works. So yeah, to that point, I you know me, man. I give Trent all the smoke just like I would give Dave all the smoke because I'm just I'm I'm a fan of the sport before I was ever a fan of the Jaguars. I'm sorry. I'm I'm you know, I'm the young age of 39. So I can remember a time when we didn't have the the team and I'm over here just rooting for the Cowboys and every other team just because that's who happened to be on this on on the TV. So yeah, I'm a fan of the sport. So I'm going to objectively look at this like I'm not a fan of the team, like I'm not wearing these teal glasses. And at the end of the day, it's not good enough. Yes, he took over a train wreck a few years ago. Yes, you also had a clean slate to make this thing in your image. And if this is your image, then your image ain't good enough. You can work on work on that, buddy. Like, I'm sorry, you got to get that better. So if we're going to compare it against another team, like, and I always look at the Detroit Lions because they were in a very similar situation when they took over their rebuild. That image is an image of strength they built from the trenches, and then they added those skill players. Jaguar skill players, not bad. Like, they're doing real well in those areas. But however, everything about this team screams finesse. And that's from the receivers blocking outside. That's from their tight end blocking in line. Like that's from your running back and how he always looks like he's getting knocked around like a pinball. So you, you know, you go with tank and then, you know, trying to, you know, you, you get a tank and you hit build this whole like, uh, I don't even know what to call it, media thing about having a tank and that's great and that's cool. But does it materialize on the field? Do you, you're not even having a fullback on the roster. All these things is just, it, it's on and on and on and on to like, you have to question not only the GM, but honestly, it sucks to say, but you kind of have to question Doug too. Those, those are some real conversations because nobody wants to give Doug the smoke because they hate Trent so much. But that goes go hand in hand. If y'all in lockstep, then y'all gonna have to be in lockstep out the door if this don't work out. At the end of the day, if I got to you're the chef, the coach is like, you got to cook the food. If the mm -hmm. food don't taste good, don't nobody know if it came from Walmart or if it came from, um, Rose or wherever it came from. Bottom line is the food got to taste good when you get it to me. I thought we were heading into a serious um, role because this is what I think. They're, 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 they're trying to get rid of this position except for the good teams. All the good teams have fullbacks. And I thought we was going in the right direction until they picked up this guy who ain't never played fullback before. And then I was still like, all right, well, we can learn. I even offered my services. I said, I'll go. I coach him up real quick. You got to pay me a lot. Just give me a fact. I know you, I know how the NFL works. Give me the free meals. Give me my breakfast and my lunch. And then, you know, we'll work on some, we'll work on the other stuff. Because I know if it's the, the food's good. At least it was in New Orleans. That's part of the reason why I didn't last more than one season because the food was too damn good in New Orleans. But they're not serious with, or focused when it comes to that. But it comes down to when the initial thing happened. And the entire city lost their mind because the city in of itself is, is, is a seminal purgatory. It's basically um, the suburb of Gainesville, and the reason. And then when, when Urban Meyer came back, and then they brought they kept Balky from the as from the assistant, and they moved and promoted him. That's how you kind of saw things going in, in the right and wrongest direction. Um, I know me and T. We both did First Coast News that day. I had I had only one problem, and it wasn't even a sincere problem. I just don't. You just drafted a running back in the first round that actually did have success. Regardless of what people want to say about bust or not, you don't. The, the standard is a thousand yards for a running back, and the man did it all but one season, which he was hurt. And then the, the guy that you brought in as a free agent rushed for a thousand yards. So you know you can get the results without drafting the guy, the 32nd overall pick, even though it's like a second round pick. And I saw what he did to my alma mater, but that motherfucker ain't do what the fuck he did to my alma mater in Jacksonville yet. I have seen this man make people miss in a phone book. 
I have seen this man stretch it up and accelerate. I see this dude not make a soul miss. I see him tripping over his feet, and he's allergic to the end zone at times. It is so frustrating to watch a guy who terrorized you for four years. Now you're ready to be his fan, and he can't do what you – but you still hit certain numbers. You did him and Trevor Lawrence, but there was so much more you could have done in that draft if it's about winning. And, again, you don't have to be a GM or make millions of dollars to make some common sense moves. I, even though I said I think you, you surround Gardner with talent, I'm not mad at the Trevor Lawrence number one overall pick. That's fine. What I am mad about is, is the fact that you didn't go get another offensive lineman immediately after that. You did not go and get him a wide receiver after that. You did not do things. You, you tried to get him a weapon that was comfortable at, at running back. But where is that the standard across the NFL? Where is that industry practice? Oh, I'm going to draft a franchise quarterback. At, at quarterback. Hmm, what goes well with the quarterback? You know what? Running back. That's right. It's like saying, you know what? Peanut butter and jelly is so delicious. I crave a peanut butter and jelly sandwich so I can get full. I'm going to get peanut butter. And I, I'm going to, what goes good with peanut butter besides jelly? Avocado. I'm going to get peanut butter and avocado and I'm going to sell this. Both are good, separate. But they don't necessarily always pair for the for a great lunchtime treat or snack. But so we got all of that stuff. And even regard, even outside of that, they have one in spite of. One of my favorite things of saying is that a con, and this is why I don't give Doug too much smoke, even though he does deserve it. I don't give him too much. Competent coaching in the NFL gets you to 500. A good coach, and, and when I try to explain to people why I don't get as emotionally invested in the NFL as college. You can lose games. 17-game schedule, most of the teams are going to fall in between 9 and 8. Or, excuse me, yeah, 9 and 8 or 8 and 9. Two teams that are two wins above that, guess what they get? Hell, they might get a bye. But you definitely go into the playoffs if you win. Or, as I say, win 10 and you're in. If you, if you, lose, more than, if you lose more than 8, or let's say you go to 6, that means you're probably going to be a top 10 pick. So it's most teams are right there in average. So they got the pieces. That's why I think Doug is good, except for this year. Doug's first year, the way they started was piss poor. The way they finished was amazing. Last year, the way they started was really, really good. The way they finished was piss poor. Is that a, a result of coaching just coaching lapses or just clearly not having enough talent to be able to maintain what you need to maintain in the NFL? I, I'll go first here, Trav. I, I think it's it's a lack of identity. The, the Jaguars remind me of <clears> – I might be describing myself here a little bit. The Jaguars remind me of a dude that's gambled okay his whole life. Like, I ain't never really lost my shirt. No pun intended, James, but I never really lost my shirt. I ain't never got rich. But I kind of won more than I lost. You know what I'm saying? So if I'm going to go to the casino two days in a row, I may have a hot start today and then not end up so well. But then tomorrow, I may start off slow, and then I might end up at the end of the night recouping what I lost plus a little bit more, and I can call that a successful weekend because basically I'm 9 and 8, right? Well, then you have another dude that wins every time. He does the same thing every single time because he knows who he is, and what we're describing are the Ravens, the Chiefs. Those are the teams where when you put that disc into that hard drive, it's going to be the same thing every single week. You know who you are. You know what your mission is. To get back to your point, James, they took ETN because they needed speed. Then they signed Philip Dorsett. They needed speed. And then last year in the draft, which was two years later, they drafted Tank because they needed to be more physical on the goal line. And they drafted Britton Strange because, see, to me, that's cherry picking. To me, if you want to be fast and strong, those are things that are just synonymous with the way you go out and evaluate. You just go out and get fast, strong people. That is a that is a non-negotiable, and you don't have to go cherry pick. Well, we need speed. Let me get this fast guy because I'm going to hit you up to something. One of the so-called fastest teams we've ever seen in the NFL was the Dallas Cowboys in the early 90s. Let's go through the, the skilled players. Was Emmitt Smith fast? No. Was Jay Novacek fast? Was Michael Irvin fast? No. You know where they were fast? They were fast. But, but you know, I mean, I mean, Trav. Hmm? 
Michael Irvin taking the bump. Mike. Oh, yeah, yeah. Everybody, yeah, yeah. <laughs> everybody fast with that booger. A little shit, faster, bro. yeah. I talking about, <laughs> but my thing is, is shout out to Michael Irvin because I think he's doing real well right now. But the, the thing is, where they were fast and where they had their advantage is in the 320-pound linemen were faster than everybody else. Mm-hmm. That Leon Lett was 6'6", 300 pounds, and he was faster than anybody his size. So now you have relevant speed. And now it looks like your whole team is fast because you're fast in places everyone else is slow. And where you're not fast, you're just very, very good, like Emmett and 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 Irvin and those guys were. And eventually the cumulative effect on that wears you down. What is that called? An identity. That's what that is. That is a DNA, that is a fingerprint for a football team, and the Jaguars just don't have it. You don't know what you're gonna get from week to week. You just don't. No. I think I agree. I, at the end of the day, if you don't know what you want to be, and if all that you wanted originally, if it was just, I'm just going to gather guys, I'm just going to gather talent, and I'm going to let the coach figure out how to use that, and then the coach has their identity, which is just, hey, I'm going to pass, this, I'm going to pass, 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 and then try to close the game out running the ball, but you can never take the lead then it's never really going to matter. You're never really going to be able to establish that running game when you feel like you need to and when you want to. So in 2022, that's kind of what it always was. It was always them coming back at the end. And we say 2022. Let's not pretend the first half of 2022 didn't count. Like, like it just didn't matter. Like they just got a mulligan for all those first, you know, first half of the season. That streak at the end of the season, while it was great, does not, you can't just uh, like eliminate that first half. And you can, especially after seeing 2023, well, all right, it's kind of looking the same. Like that that switch never it never flipped. And Christian Kurtz said it towards the end of the season. He was like, "Hey man, we were all expecting that 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 switch to flip at the end of the season because it just happened the year before even though none of us can tell you why it happened." That's kind of where they are right now. Their identity essentially was, "Let's just hope to get to the end of the game and let's just come back somehow some way." If that's your identity, man, that's 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 a wish. Bro, Bro that's like, like yeah, that's like throwing a jump ball, James, on third and fifteen. Yeah, you, you just hoping to hit that street. Yeah, you just there. hoping to hit this street. You just hoping that it just turns on out of nowhere. And if it don't happen, then everybody got kind of got their hands up and their hands out at the end of the season. And that's kind of what we are. You brought up a great point, Wig, about gambling, and I think that is the identity of Trent Baalke. Um, The the really pick was gambling. It was like. Let's be honest, the man had played football for almost two years. Um, he was already old. I always used to joke about people say, like, shit, Calvin really my age. <laughs> so I mean, I'm talking about him. Because they didn't realize how old he was when he got drafted. Um, but explosive, nonetheless, great footwork. And you thought one of his traits was how he ran routes and the consistency that he would bring to that. Now you add that to a guy who I Christian Kirk is not a number one wide receiver. What is he? He is a great number two, which is nothing wrong with being a great number two. Evan Ingram provided you something at tight end. And the person that I actually, too, you remember, I criticized the hell out of him. I called him, I still call him Crazy Zay. I love Crazy Zay now. But like, I knew he was crazy when I saw him put that. Is that a wig or is that really his hair? I think it's his hair, man. I don't know why. I, was he I, Indian or something? No, nah, I, I don't know. No, no his dad is Robert he Jones. Robert, Robert Jones looked like me, so that can't be it. You know what? I, I, I uh, I'm somewhere between. I ain't gonna lie to you. I'm somewhere between Easy E and the Beatles. I'm trying to figure out what that thing is. It's like it's like a pixie cut that ain't been trimmed up right. You Bro, know, when I saw and him, then sometimes like, they get a little moist. So I'm just everybody keep tagging me to my Zay. You need to go to wig. I'm like. I don't want that kind of pressure. Ain't nobody <laughs> don't, don't send him to me. Listen, man. Plus, that boy nuts. That's the boy who was running butt booty ass Nikki. Was it with, was it with the Bills? And then what they did was decide to send him to the craziest place that you could send a crazy person. Damn, mm-hmm. Las Vegas. Yeah. Like, don't send that boy there. But when he came, <laughs> he got the the, the, the the the. I don't know what yeah. happened. I'm hoping the best for him. He's they dropped the DB charge. But that's when I was like, when that happened, like that's crazy thing. But we didn't have that con- that consistency where all three really played at one time. And when Crazy Zay was out there on that field, Trevor, like, forget Christian Kirk, forget Calvin Ridley. It was something about what Zay brought to the defense. He was the take the top off the defense guy, as opposed to what we thought Calvin Ridley was going to be. But injuries, craziness, regardless, we did not have that. Um, and And we learned that. 
and I, and I hate the terminology because we see it everywhere else. Now you saw it on a bad scale with with um with Bryce Young and God, that's child abuse what they're doing to him in Carolina, what they did to him. Mm -hmm. But when we look over to the look over to the Midwest, little the Southwest, and we see what our, our division rival is doing, it's crazy where you can put the game like you can't put the game in Trevor's hands, but he's generational, he's iconic, he's all of these these superlatives that they give people, but he had the opportunity, and he should have been the better quarterback in the final half of that season. What were we eight and three when we went in there, and then we played eight back of whatever many games remaining. We played nothing but backups outside of Lamar Jackson, and was it outside of Lamar Jackson? Oh, and, and we played in Texas. So outside of those two games, we played backups. Rookies, we should be able to dominate them. But when we see what the Texans are doing, should that kind of make Jaguar fans a little nervous right now, or is it just? The thing where we hope that they have a sophomore slump like what we just had. Go ahead, Trav. Uh, I, I went through that whole process that the, the night of the big trade. Um, I mean, I was mad for the first few hours. A few hours later, I'm like, well, you know what? Ain't nothing wrong with second place. You know what? Well, we, 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 could, we could find a way to make this happen. Uh, by the end of the night, I'm like, all right, all right, man. All right. And, and we, we can split. I don't know how it's going to happen. We're going to split because we always split because that's the AFC South. That's how this goes. And by the end, I'm like, all right, whatever. We'll figure it out. And that's I'm going through that whole little you know, grief, whatever you want to call it, process to come to the same conclusion of uh, I'm, I'm not the wish guy. I'm not the optimism guy. I'm not that guy that's going to just hope that it happens because I support this team. That's that's not who I am. And if I'm going to always keep it 100 and keeping it 100 is, yeah, absolutely, I'm fearful. And I ain't even fearful for, for just the quarterback. I'm, I'm fearful for the offensive coordinator. I actually appreciate their leadership. I appreciate their GM. And that's, again, this ain't a Texans podcast, but that's, again, I am a fan of the sport. So I am objectively looking at this front office. I am objectively looking at this team and how they do things and then comparing that to what we have. And I'm just like, all right, yeah, that's something that you should be scared of. And if you're not a little fearful of that, then you probably ain't paying attention. You're right. And um, I will piggyback on that and say this. For all the fans that that get angry at, at me, I also cover Locked On NFL. So I, I do a Jaguars podcast, but I don't even do that podcast as a fan. I try to be as objective as I can. And the thing is, is all, everybody screamed out, Stefan Diggs, 31. And I said, how old, how old do you think Calvin Ridley is? And y'all was just begging to get him back. Mm -hmm. How old do you think Calvin Ridley is? Well, he had a slow season. He had 100 balls. He caught 100 balls last year. Okay, so that, that – and it wasn't like Evan Ingram where he caught 100 balls and had 400 yards. And I'm being facetious, but <laughs> my yeah. thing is he, he caught 100 yards and had over 1,000, right? He's a number one wide receiver. And – well, he's just going to tear up the locker room. He ain't never tore up a locker room when he first got to know to a place, and he's going to be a free agent after this year. You think that man's going to really go over there and mess up his money? And then, by the way, when he gets off of work every day, he ain't in Minnesota or Buffalo no more. He in Houston, Texas. I got two daughters that live in Houston, Texas. That man ain't got nothing to be angry about when he gets off work in Houston, Texas. So the thing is, is we can sugarcoat it all we want to. The bottom line is, they got Stefan Diggs. We got Stefan Diggs, other receiver, who while they were together, everybody said Diggs needed some help. And I'm not, I'm not dissing Gabe Davis because for what he's going to offer the Jaguars, hopefully they'll get it because they don't have it. That's a seam, a seam wide receiver. Because even though Evan Ingram's a tight end, he lives outside of the hash marks, and we know that. And he lives in the flat. He's not George Kittle where he's running down the seam and you hit him with a 20-yard bullet by aiming the ball at the back of the head of the Mike linebacker, which was what you do in the Tampa too. So the thing is, is we have to take inventory. All we heard about was Daniel Hunter around here forever. They got him too. And people, Danico Autry's old. Danico Autry is a five technique that can play inside who is a beast against the run. I mean, what are we doing here? We don't have to crap on what somebody else is doing because we keep falling short i don't trent is just the type of dude man that is going to find a bargain and i was a, i grew up washington fan when i was a kid and bobby bether did that he took Dell green from texas a and i he did all of this stuff he did a whole bunch of things you weren't supposed to do and guess what it worked until it didn't and at the end of his tenure in washington they ran him out of there because he kept doing what gene smith used to do here going to mount union and just because you hit the lottery one time dog you got to quit buying scratch off it ain't gonna keep working you, you only have one chance to do it so the thing is is for trent balky 
I think he's the dude that wants to get a whole bunch of sevens. And we just heard, I read something about John Calipari today. The people in Kentucky were tired of him because he was hell bent on proving he could do it his way instead of just doing it. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about your way. You got to you gotta just understand it ain't about you. Bill Parcells, one of the greatest coaches ever, say, I could get you the halftime of the conference championship game. Those last six quarters to win the title is on you. I mean, you said it. I mean, listen, there's guys who got me going to always sell in America, no matter no matter what. And that's basically what, what you're you're describing as trend. It's nothing wrong with going out here and getting um, better commodities, um, you know, and not being pressured. And so it's a, it seems like it's a combination of being pressured into getting what the fans want and then being stuck in your own ways. It's like those top picks. Oh, what's going to cause the excitement as opposed to what's going to help us win? And you know, yeah, which I think you guys' drafts are a little more um, on the the side of what's going to help us win, which makes me fearful that we're going to do not going to do, um, do any of that. Um, but the only pick I've ever really I did like the um, the, the the pick last year. I did like the tackle, even though he didn't play. He played the other. He played the right tackle. He never played when he was. Which he played right tackle as a freshman, but he was known as a left tackle. Um, that kind of threw me off. I was not a fan of um, Cam Robinson at the gate. I'm not saying he's not an NFL player, just for what we needed, and then we re-signed him. The only time I've ever seen Cam Robinson be tough was when um, me O'Brien asked him about if Walker Little was there to take his position, and then he got tough on the petite white girl. That was the only. That's the toughest I've ever seen him in my life, which is not a good. It's not a good sign for me, left tackle. On top of it, what really made me mad was again, as you said, Trent said you're born that way. Like, like, it's a, like you're not born that. You can get stronger. You can get faster. It, it you are born with some things, but that's another podcast. I'm not going to get into my science background. But I'll say this: I am very upset the fact that he got popped for PEDs. If you get popped for PEDs, you got to be strong, man. At least bully people. Yeah. Like Ray Lewis out there doing deer antler spray, the greatest linebacker to ever play. It's like it's a, like I love. I have no problem. Sean Merriman, who I got a chance to interview at the, at the, at the Super Bowl, knocked the hell out of me in college. I knew he was on steroids when he hit me. I ain't never been hit like that before. So when he got popped, ah, it makes sense. Then he sucked after that. So like at least Cam be dominant if we're gonna get popped by steroids. But what do you what do you what do you think about what are your thoughts this coming draft and what direction? Would you like the Jags to go and do you think Balk is Well, I want him to go somewhere where he's never gone and been successful, and that's that wide receiver. And um, the, the one thing I will – now, y'all mark this for – mark this. y'all got to snap this one out and bookmark it. The one thing I will say I don't think he's going to blow is a first-round pick. I like the Trayvon pick. I mean, I, I could go – I, I could, But I could listen to both <laughs> arguments. I can listen to the argument, and me and you have had this discussion plenty of times in my suite, James, in my office. I, I know I, I get it. I think this year you finally start to see what I, what I'm talking about and what everybody else. He's a good player. He's a, a real really good player. Good player. And, and also what I don't, a large member. I saw yeah. him at the Super Bowl. I said, yo, I got to watch my mouth. Yeah, he got some long arms, too. And, and That motherfucker like, big, though. Like, <laughs> it, like, I was just like – He's a good ball. I just didn't like him as number one. Go ahead. Right, 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 right. So, and, and what I and I try not to get hung up on number one because I know it's not monolithic. I, I know number one this year ain't my number one two years ago. And mm-hmm. number one, you know, he might have been the six. I know this. Detroit was taking him at two if we didn't take him. Mm-hmm. I knew that. That's the thing by hanging at Vitz at the Senior Bowl. Somebody look you dead in your face and say they're going one or two. So that's just what it was for that year, and in that. The scheme that they ran with Todd Wash, he's a he's a he's a he's a four B Calais Campbell type. The problem I have with them is their usage. I don't want to see that big old man you talked about. And James, he is big. He big without even trying to be. He just mm-hmm. big. It's like he, you get frustrated at him if you're mad at him. The first thing you're gonna say is get your big ass out the way because that's how big he is. Why is he in coverage? Why is he going backwards? So the thing I like about Ryan Nielsen. <laughs> we're going that way. He's going to put his hand in the ground. We're going that way. We're going to move him around just like they did at Georgia. We're going that way. And somebody who's that sudden with that size and that strength, and that, you need to put him right on top of whoever he's going against right now. You don't need to let him get no running start from way out there at a bad angle. 
So it was just too many times that I saw things from a coaching standpoint. I watched Chris Jones play defensive end and go straight up the hash for three or four steps and then turn. And I watched them line Trayvon up and he's angled off at the tackle and he runs right into the guy and think he's going to bully and long arm everybody. That's coaching. That's also a mentality that I go back to is who are you? What are you doing? You can't say that you're all aggressive and you got your biggest, baddest dude backing up into the flat to go tackle a, a tight end. It just doesn't make sense to me, and none of it did, and I'm glad they switched it up. Yeah. Um, and they, they needed a scheme change. And with the defense, that was not that was sort of a given. And I would even argue that was the same thing for the offensive line. But, I mean, coach, I don't know how we keep the O-line coach, but then we have all the complaints about how the O-line plays. But, again, I don't get paid to do this. I'm just get paid to criticize it. But, yeah, that, that was a weird thing for me also. Um, so I'm happy to see the defensive staff. You no, know, I'm gonna say I'm not happy to see them be let go, but I am happy to see the scheme change in that way. Uh, to to Wig's point, um, but I also happy to see them bring in someone like an Armstead, someone you know, Arik, someone who could also show, uh, you know, someone who can show Trevon how to, you know, play that edge in that that big end way. But also, he's someone who can be. I think we're gonna see a lot more of Armstead at the edge than a lot of people even originally think. Um, he's gonna. He might play that Calais role, and they flip. They, they put both of both him and Trevon on the same side, or they can mix and match kind of whatever they want to do, depending on who they get in the draft. So, I'm looking forward to how Nilsson's going to be able to use him because he definitely gave him the dog and being able to you know use these guys in that interchangeable way. Uh, play be a lot of multiple play of what, whatever different front fronts they want to play, whether it's a three three five or a four two five or whatever. Um, so I'm excited about all of that. However, at the end of the day. I where the team goes, I don't trust Trent to make this pick as far as as far as receivers concerned. Sorry, that's just to be clear. Um, I want it to be a receiver, especially if you have a, even a remote possibility of getting one of those top three guys. Maybe you have to trade up a little bit, trade up to that nine ten spot, something along those lines. You got to do it. Um, but otherwise, if Trent knows who he is and it sounds like he knows who he is, good and bad then, hey, man, you know you don't draft receivers well and you want to trade them picks away, you want to pull a, you know, a, a you know a Ram situation where they just historically just trade away those top picks and get you a guy who's, you know, confirmed good. If that's who you are, I'm, I can only judge you based on who you are at the end of the day. Trade the pick away, get someone in the door, whether it's IU, you know, Sutton, whoever, um, veteran receiver, and just land your early picks because at the end of the day, that's the only way that this team is going to be a little bit, just, just a little bit better. Those middle picks, <laughs> I did not agree with the 2022 draft for, for so many reasons. And we have a lot of fans who, I won't say disagree fully, but they have different different disagreements. Well, let's look at, you know, uh, Antonio Johnson as a higher pick and maybe it kind of works out. And I'm like, I don't believe in all that. Uh, you can land on a late round on a late round pick and still say, this second to fourth round picks did not go as that, there's no way that wasn't the plan. And that's critical that you said that. And James, let me, let me say this to segue into you real quick. I got crushed the day that they gave Foy Olu O'Connor an extension <laughs> because I was, I was, you know, doing my other gig, you know, standing there taking clients and I couldn't really respond. I had to go sit in my car and give a response. I don't know how you cover this team, and I'm not taking a swipe at the media, but I kind of am because I'm on the sports den and I can do that right now. But I tell you this, I don't know how you don't understand this. If they're playing a 4-2-5 and even an old 3 4 where both Trayvon and Josh are your ends, that gives you two off-ball linebackers. One is kind of a Mike and the other one is kind of a Will, sort of like Levante David moved from a straight Will as a Hall of Famer to an off-ball middle linebacker basically in Tampa. So that's what you have. Patrick Queen is that same dude, those kinds of guys, right? You draft, you've signed for a little kind of a three-year deal. That was two years ago. And then you trade it up, and we were at the cigar bar you own, James. They drafted Devin Lloyd. So I left the stadium, and I came to the cigar bar to take a break. And then they traded up and drafted for the next day. They drafted Chad Moon. Mm -hmm. And people were like, what are they doing? I say, well, here's the thinking. This has to be the only – I told Pete Prisco this from CBS. So this has to be the only thing that they're thinking. Foy's going to be here for two years. They're going to move him out, and then they'll have their two starting linebackers who will both be 23, 24 years old, and they'll run them out the way Trent did when he had Patrick Willis and 
the line, the other linebacker out there. I can't think of his name right now. Kid for Penn State. I think he's a coach somewhere right now. Uh, Navarro Bowling. I said that's what they're gonna do. Those dudes are gonna be side by side for a long time, kind of like Luke Keekley and Thomas Davis. And I know mm-hmm. I'm reaching here when I say these guys can be that good, but at the time that you do that, that's why you do it. You don't rush them. You let them compete, but then you have three linebackers because they had nobody on the team at the time who could play that way because they traded away an all pro to the Jets because they said he was too small, if you remember, in Quentin Williams. So when I think about it like this, I'm saying that's the only way that this works. And then they give Foy a contract extension. They don't even let him finish playing this year. They gave him another extension for a whole bunch of more money. And I'm like, that means one of those picks, uh, it was a bad pick now. And here's why. Trevor's on a, a, a rookie deal. At some point, all of this nilly-willy free spending is going to go away. You ain't going to be able to do it when he starts making 45 or $50 million a year. And the thing that Trav said, second, third, fourth, fifth, you got to hit on those picks. And mm-hmm. if you don't, you will never be able to surround him. And all we talked about here is, well, Balky don't draft receivers, so maybe he's going to stay away from what he doesn't do. If you're trying to talk around the guy doing his job, he shouldn't be the one doing it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I know that. I've been yeah. in agreement. I've been in agreement. No, no, I'm with, with you. I'm with you. But that's the wow. point. But that's the part. That's where Jaguar fans have been so beat down. Histo- just historically, we've been so beat down by either bad or at bare minimum subpar GMs that we are willing to negotiate with our better selves. We know this ain't the best thing for the team, but we're at this point, we're like, man, we're not shy time. We can't get rid of him. Let's just pray. Let's just pray to whatever God we pray to that <laughs> this man who is obviously not good at doing this thing, he'll we'll find the best possible way for him to stumble into a good decision. That's where we are. Yeah. So when I think about teams that are built like that, think about Pete Carroll, which again, he comes from a came from a college background, understood what he was looking for, and that's why he was able to hit that Legion of Boom was able to be so good for that period of time. Is because there was a bunch of mid tier picks. If there was a draft to be successful on the defensive side of the ball with mid mid tier picks, this would be the one. Um, and I um, but again, I don't. No, you're this right. is the homer in me. But you're this but no. Great, but you're, you are fully correct, though, and I do. I do. Well, I I join in on a podcast on Mondays or every two every other Monday with a Seattle Seahawks uh, podcaster, and he's always talking about how well those dudes drafting in those middle rounds. But what else those dudes used to always do is they would they would crap and get off the pot early. One to two years in, they know if this is the guy already, and he's off the roster. It could be a second round draft pick, and all of a sudden, gone. They are. They immediately know what they're looking for. That's the identity thing. Was Wit was talking about. They know what they're looking for. They know if you are, you are not it in one to two years. And that development process, then they're, they're done. That they're, they're here, or they're out. And they were quickly able to identify that. And again, that goes back to also Trent. But that's the conversation between Doug and his staff as far as their onboarding, as far as do you know what you're looking for, and are you willing to let this go if it's not going to work. You know, Brandon Strange draft it now. Are you if you if it's not the guy, are you willing to move on for him a year to two years and let's just keep this thing moving? So in 2022, and this is after the year before, when the Chiefs went to the Super Bowl. I believe the Chiefs went to the Super Bowl. No, this might have been the year before that, but they went to the Super Bowl and they lost to Tampa because they couldn't block. 21. Him. That was 21, right? Then those boys they went out and got the center from Oklahoma, <laughs> the kid they got now. Mm-hmm. They got Trey Smith from Tennessee. The center from Oklahoma is like an all pro level player. And Trey Smith. Awesome from- name too, by the way. Me and Denny got to interview him on 10 10. Nobody wanted to interview him. We right. had a great interview. Right. So when you look, they had Legarius Sneed on the roster already. They drafted Trent McDuffie in round one, all pro, not pro bowler, all pro, nickel with no interceptions. They drafted Carl Lathers, who I thought was going to get somebody fired, but he went right to the right spot and they didn't have to start him right away in the first round. They drafted Sky Moore, who they, they've overdrafted. They then drafted Brian Cook. Then they drafted Leo Chanel. Then they drafted Joshua Williams. Then they drafted Jalen Watson later. Uh, Jalen Watson later. Now, let me explain something to you. Here's why all of that is important. Because this year, when they realized they couldn't keep paying everybody and they had to let Legarius Sneed walk, Guess who's starting for him? Jalen Watson. Guess who's the other outside corner? Joshua Williams. Guess who's their starting safety? 
Brian Cook. And guess who their starting nickel? Trent McDuffie. They got them all in 2022. So when they had to move on from a dude that had earned big money, they could do it without no problems. It's like, okay, they did it with Tyreek Hill. We can't keep everybody. They won two Super Bowls since he left. All right, we can't keep you, Lejarius. We're going we're gonna to tag you now, but we'll take a third-round pick for you. You go ahead and be happy. But guess what they have already? In-house replacements. That is what Chad Moomer was supposed to be to Foy Oluwakon. That's why I say the math ain't mathing. At some point, we are going to be expecting Trent Balky to do something and to prove to us that he can do something, that he has never proved that he could do it before, and now you're doing it with a checkbook that is not unlimited like it used to be. You're Here's asking for trouble. Right. Here's my thoughts. Uh, my boy Blake, shout out to Blake, one of my favorite white boys. Um, he has this phrase, but it's, it's for skilled players. So I don't want to see a white boy in the um, in the secondary. I'm a, before people get mad at me. I'm I'm gonna prep. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you your bone. This this channel is no is no such thing. I, colors are white on this channel because if you're watching me on YouTube, we got people with green. It, you could be white colored. That means you paid three dollars and ninety nine cents. You are right with me. You are colored today. Whites are the ones who didn't pay, so I can identify you that way. But what I'm saying is, I don't want to see a white lineman. Like, I want to see a white boy on our defense, unless they're proven. They, they're, they're stamped. We know what they do. I don't, especially for Wyoming, that is wherever movement. That's, that's true white. I mean, he ain't even got no hip hop influence. In he needs some mother cats in there. Now, I'm going to flip it now. We got too many black people on our offensive line at this point. <laughs> Y'all can't say this stuff. I can't fire. If the day I fire myself is the day I get Baker at it. So, like, I ain't on. But I, but T-Way, you know me for a while. I say this shit on 10 yeah. Give me a good country ass white boy that's just, give me a white. That's why I need a Wyoming kid from. I, need a, I don't even know if they, in Iowa, I don't even need to know if they, if they, just, I need to see such and such, whatever the whitest name you could get me, Iowa, tight end or, or, or offensive lineman. Oh, we go. We good. We we cook it right. I know they create a brand. What you said? What they do well? They don't do nothing else. They gonna do. They gonna give me a good lineman or a good tight end. I don't want that. Don't don't you balk you? You listening? Don't you go out there and get get um um bamboozled by how fast that white boy is? Don't you do it? Are you talking about Cooper? 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 It's one of my exciting whites, but I don't want him over here. He, I want to see him succeed somewhere else. I don't think we know how to do that now. Like, for his, but that. So I need that. But when I look at now, there is one exception. If the second now, don't do this shit in the first round. But if the second round come around, and there's a white boy who looked like Bubba Sparks, I didn't know what he sounded like, T. We until I went to the combine. But a boy from Florida State, you're my Fisky. Fisky. Oh, <laughs> That's an exciting one. I'll take that white boy. Come on, bring him. Bring him on over here. I've seen what he can do. I've seen what he's punished people. Fish is sound like Paul Wall. He's like, he talking like Paul Wall. Like Paul Wall. He got the haircut. He's like, hey, man. I said, you going to run a four? He said, nah, man, I'm good. I can go out there and run a four seven. Bro. I said, you said you could run a four five. I said, man, four five. That'll change my life. It, I'm like, he's so calm, so smooth. Like, if you close, it's like my roommate in college, Kyler Hall. White boy safety. Coach, so if people get mad at me, get mad at Coach Andrews too. Coach Andrews walked up to Kyler Hall and said, you should thank God every day because I don't have whites on my defense. This is a white man from Alabama told a white boy from, from um, Lago that he don't like white boys on his defense. But that means he, that's a, he should take pride in it. But if you close your eyes and listen to K. Hall talk, you don't know you're talking to a white boy. You think you're talking to a black kid. Right. But I like Fisk. And when I was saying the second round, you got J um, Jerry and Jones. Even if the second or fifth round, Jerry Jones, Renardo Green, you're what you gotta do is I, I'm not with if he doesn't draft wide receivers, personally, I really do think we have pieces. What we have to do is demand more of the dude who's about to demand more money. He has we have got mm -hmm. to you said it best, Travis. Cut again, like you gotta know when to cut bait. If Trevor Lawrence is everything that we think he is, Trevor Lawrence better prove it this year and be able to carry the damn team. You got Gabe. You got Christian. You got us. We didn't get we, crazy. Zay coming back, right? Is he still on the roster? He's still, yeah, he's still there. I believe he's still okay. So you got him now. If you can get somebody like a good value fund, but you got enough weapons on offense. 
to where if you're a generational quarterback, you got to make them better. What we need to do is get that damn defense up to par. Because, again, as we were talking about really, now, granted, the mayonnaise banana eating boy up in Tennessee doesn't really strike fear in me. If that's their starting quarterback, I ain't worried about it. But, uh, but, um, but uh, you know, broke clock right twice a day. So we need somebody to be able to cover him, cover those guys. Indy just got to – and the AR going to still play like he in high school. I love AR, but, like, AR trying to run over everybody. I ain't worried about that. But I am worried about what they got in Texas um, with the Texans. And you got to be able to put pressure on that quarterback, and you got to have guys that can lock people up. And there is a lot of corners that are out there that are that are, that don't get the praise. Again, me being a homer, like I can't understand how Malik neighbors, I believe it's Thomas from LSU, are literally. Um, now I do like the, the white boy from Florida. It's a pure song. Ricky, oh, Ricky, Ricky. Awesome play. Yeah, Chris but awesome play. these are guys that are, are ascending, right? But they got shut down by these two guys that. Hardly anybody is talking about which goes into our favor because they should be there. So go find the people that you can find in the middle rounds that you're going to be able to incorporate and put in on defense. Um, hell, if you need to talk about undersized linebackers, he's going to be there third day. But you got to you got a Kalen Deloach that's there that can flat out run mm-hmm. and be able and, and hit and move. Make your defense so much better that it gives you the opportunities because at the end of the day, I don't think Trevor performed well, and then when he got hurt, it really – our offense just went to shit. But you got to be able to stop. And there's there were there were three games that we should have won in that in that back stretch that we had that would have given us a bye. They had absolutely no – excuse me, it would have given us a bye, but we would have been in a better position. We had absolutely no reason losing – most of the games that we lost toward the end. So that's what gives hope. And at the end of the day, I've been here in Jacksonville since 2007. I've only known two years for the Jets. They've only made it, well, no, they made it more than that. But at least in media, this is year nine for me. I've only known two years where they've actually been good enough for me to get extra innings. 2017, anybody who was in media in 2017, though, and that was so crazy. We forgot national signing. Like, like, we forgot what to do because the Jags went on the road. So it's not far off. It's be- like they averaged four wins a season since I, like, in the last decade, including the 2017 run. So I think they're close, but I do think we have to de- – they've got to demand more of two people, Balky and Trevor Lawrence. And if not, everybody's gone, including um, Doug Peterson. The Trevor that I want to show up is the Trevor – that when everybody was talking about C.J. Stroud, right? Trevor went to Houston and had the best game he's had probably in his career, considering the circumstances. It was almost like like your favorite rapper, James Hole. Allow me to introduce myself, <laughs> to reintroduce myself. Right. Whatever you thought it was, I'm your Huckleberry. Basically, that's what he did that day, and the Jaguars won the football game. Now, for me to take that next step, I want to see Chippy Trevor. I don't want to see Trevor all happy with everybody. I, I, I want the quarterback to lead. And I'm not saying be just, just an ass for no reason, but I am saying that what you have to do sometimes is this is do or die. This is everybody's legacy. Y'all want to talk about 10 years from now, y'all want to say shoulda, coulda, woulda like they did in 2017? Mm-hmm. Y'all want to say shoulda, coulda, woulda when Lamar Jackson was sitting there and they took Taven Bryan? You know, we don't, we don't want to do that. You don't have time. And they they did one thing uh, with Doug Peterson. They insulated Trevor from being a press secretary and every time something go wrong, having to run a microphone out there in front of his face the way they did with Urban, that was good. But the other thing that they have to do now, and Doug alluded to it, I think the media has to stop feeling like fans going in there asking this guy. One minute, they're telling you that Trevor is generational. The next minute, they're asking Doug, do you think you put too much on his plate? And Doug laughed at him. Like, what are you talking about? It's your quarterback. So how can you – I learned this from Belgium Outwaz. They said you better not buy one unless you're going to work him two hours a day and make him run because he's going to tear your house up. And I think big-time athletes want to work. I think the difference is the guys that are super talented, and I was not one of them athletically, all of the guys that were super talented that actually made it, the difference between them and the dude you know that was better than him when y'all were 16 years old, the difference is he loved the process. 
He Not loved the work. They play three hours, 17 times a year minimum. That's 51 hours. Do you know how hard you got to work? Do you know how hard Chris Brown practiced before the concert when you see everything perfect? You have to love the process of football. You have to love and eat, drink, and sleep everything about it. And then when those people around you don't love it, you got to complain and be a, a, a be a jerk like number 20 used to. Now, Wig, now you just said something that you know ain't going to change. We have the most unique market. National radio doesn't work in Jackson. It's amazing. I love it. Right. But in that, we have the most fan fanatic people who are professionals, which is why, you know, point of point of contention I want to make. And then they don't listen to the fan base. We got way more people on the impromptu just throw some shit together um, on Twitter viewing than a local radio station that has a bunch of fans. That, that cover it, but I'm not gonna say any names or drop any hints, but two of the three people on this panel actually worked at that shit. And this could be theirs. But real only works when you actually have somebody back. It. I remember talking so real at one point. Now this guy, we you'll know who I'm talking about. He, was, he, he had one back when he told him being too real. He said, now they come to us, cause you're being too hard on the old man. He said, now they come to us and say, he's too hard on the old man. Which one you want? You want to you want to be the, the voice of the Jaguars, or you want you want him? He said, "I'm gonna have to let you go," but I like what you're doing at the same time. So there's going to be fans asking silly ass fan questions and saying silly ass shit like, "Do you think you put too much on the number one overall pick who's the face of your franchise?" They don't say, "Do you think you did too much when you got him in the Publix commercials or when his face is on the goddamn banner when you go into the stadium?" It's not too much then, but it's too much when we ask the motherfucker throw. Here's a here's the thing. We got a we got a, a wide receiver that that basically runs the drag across the back of the end zone. How about you throw the bitch in the in inside the end zone so he can catch it? That's not asking a lot for a quarterback that's literally done that stuff. That's like called common sense, but common sense ain't that common all the time. When you got a bunch of people out there that are just happy, a bunch of happy to be here, guys. Um, that but, you got, said, but you also have a lot of people that's out here that's not that's acting like they don't have long memory. And by long memory, I'm talking about the fact that why why is Doug Peterson here? Why did Doug Peterson feel the need to insulate Trevor in all these ways? Why did Doug feel the need to bring in multiple quarterback specific, like quarterback centric guys around this offense? Like whether it's the OC, whether it's the passing coordinator, whether it's uh, you know the the even the goodness gracious the uh, tight end coach. Sorry, like all these guys are have they have a history with the quarterback. Specifically, because you want to make sure everything that we're doing is focused on this quarterback and making sure that it's going to work for him. Why did why is all this needed? Because they're trying to when they bring this guy in, I want to make sure I have the guy at quarterback. That is literally the reason that they're brought in. So if that's the reason they're brought in, they're going to give him this simple, I would say simple, but this not super complex offense. Give him this base, make sure he's good, he's good with his reads, build that base up. And whatever we have, we'll know that in the next few years, whatever whatever that ends up being. So then you can't then turn around at the end of 2023 asking the question of, are you putting too much on him? And it's like, wait, what are you talking about? Like, we literally are spoon feeding this, this offense to this guy to make sure it's built to his standard, to what he wants. What are we talking about? Like, y'all know this stuff. So stop trying to give them an out and just hold the feet to the fire. Or if you only have to hold the feet to the fire, just let the record speak for itself. Let the tape speak for itself. And let's move it along with that. The That's optimism it. I have is here, and this is the reason why. We got rid of one guy that I was happy. I hated the pick. Like, in first, I'm going to go back. You talk, talk about Taven Bryan. I think Taven Bryan's an awful person. That's how bad of a football player he was. And that, that fandom, people tried to make somebody something that they weren't. Like, Florida fans didn't know who the hell Taven Bryan was. I'm sure as hell didn't know. And when I went and watched Phil, I don't remember the center's name for Florida State, but trust me in this, he's the worst center that we've ever had at Florida State. He was whooping Taven's ass. When I, when, I, when I went and looked at highlights, I said, I know for a fact I don't want him anymore. If that's what the case, but they got him here. It, <laughs> I remember I went to the to, um, training camp. He lost every rep in one-on-ones to an undrafted rookie free agent. 
Then um, Calais had to go ask the guy, hey, man, just let him win so we can win. That's basically what I knew we were in trouble. But then I'm hearing people report about how Taven was looking good. I'm like, you couldn't have been at the same practice that I was at. I thought, I was like, if Urban's going to win, Urban's going to come in, and he's going to cut Taven Bryant. And he didn't. That's how I knew we were going to lose. I didn't know we were going to be that bad. I knew he was going to lose when he did cut Taven. Doug comes in, immediately, Taven, get your ass on. We ain't renewing nothing. And what did they do? Went to the playoffs. There was another draft pick that I still ask Dave about this to this day. It's my soul. Don't understand how you can be called a sack guru and you ain't got no facts. Um, and that's clavicle chasing or whatever the whatever the how you say his name, but <laughs> it's so bad last year. The one sack he got, they called it back because somebody got a rough in the rough in the rough like a, a penalty or something. I was like, yep, that's par for the course. They got rid of they got rid of him. So maybe they're making serious steps in the right direction by cutting the right people. I think sometimes some guys are so bad that their sorriness infects everybody else. And I think that dude from LSU, his son, the hell, he was so bad that it, it might have made everybody else bad. So I think our level of play might increase now, as long as we don't draft anybody that's that bad. I'll tell you two stories. Well, one of them I can't tell you. I was going to tell you three, but I'll tell you two quick. One of them is so bad, it's not even funny. One, of, one story is about the worst dude that's ever played here. And he it's ain't house. No, nah, it's way back. It's way back. No, nah, oh. he's an awful human being, right? And um, I'll tell you this though: I hear so much, whether it be through radio or on Twitter, or whatever, about how awful a human being Jalen Ramsey was. And I'm gonna tell you something: Jalen's a little different. Like yeah. some days you see him, he come up and give you a hug. OG, what's happening? The next day you see him, he'll walk right past you like he don't even know you, right? So at the time, there were two people in that building that kind of act like that pit bull that you run into that you don't know how he's going to act today. One was Jalen, another was Coughlin, who I really liked as a human being. Okay, you didn't know what you was getting there. You ain't never got chewed out for standing on that black that on that black rubber mat. And I actually got left there by a member of the staff when he went to answer a telephone call. I'm standing there, I'm with somebody's grandfather and you yelling at me like I'm a kid. So I, that stuff rubbed me the wrong way. But I'll tell you two stories real quick about Things that happen in the locker room. You remember when Miles Jack got drafted and everybody was begging him to put him in for Puzlesny? And I stood there and I asked the very lovable Jaguar at the time. I'm not going to mention his name because it ain't fair. But I was talking to him. I said, man, everybody want to put Miles Jack in the game. And he asked me, whose spot are you going to take? And I said, Puz. I had four people within shot of me turn around and say, you know, lost your damn mind. So the players on the team will tell you stuff that you don't hear from the coaches and you don't hear from the media. I'll tell you another story. Malik Jackson got here, signed a $90 million contract. I was talking to Malik because Malik ended up being on our radio show every, every, every Monday. So I was talking to him about it and I was talking to him about it. And I turned and I asked somebody, very lovable Jaguar. How do you feel about the new guys they brought up? He said, they cool. He said, that MF ain't worth no $90 million. When I tell you he was standing two feet away, and I looked at the dude, and the dude was like, ain't no problem. And he said, I don't care if you heard me. He ain't worth $90 million. But that's what they do. Another dude sitting there tying the shoe told me, ain't nobody worth that kind of money. I don't care who they bring in here. They, always, they don't take care of their own people. They bring other people in. They're literally having this conversation like they're talking to me and the guy. And this is Malik Jackson. Yeah. But they were saying this right in front of him. And when we dispersed, Malik came in to do the radio show. I said, man, I didn't try to get no gotcha moment. He said, that's part of the nature business. That's the business, OG. Don't worry about it. We talk to each other like that. So my, I'm saying that to say this. Everything that you hear negatively or with some little attitude, them dudes hear this stuff all day long from each other. It's mm -hmm. never as bad as you think. And most of the time, when, when media get a hold of one little comment, I can tell they've never been to a high school football games at Reigns and Rebar and stood on the sideline. I can tell they've never been in a barbershop on a Saturday morning before Sweetwater plays Grand Park and before Florida plays Georgia later that day. You would think World War III was about to break out if that's the kind of stuff that's hurting y'all's feelings to make y'all say somebody's an awful human being, then y'all ain't from where I'm from because that's normal stuff around alpha dog athletes. And they don't even mean it. Malik, 6'6", 290 pounds, and a dude stood right there and said he wasn't worth $90 million and told me, I don't give a damn if you look at him or not. He ain't going to do nothing. 
Bro, that's the locker room. And folks aren't willing to, to say that they don't understand it, but they just much say how somebody was a terrible, awful, awful, terrible, terrible, awful, awful human being because somebody told them at Lemon Bar that that's what that person is. I don't have to like you to do my job. I don't. And that's what people don't realize. Like, Travis, you've been an email. There's teammates of mine that I don't like, that I don't hang out with. I just don't hang out with them anymore. But I tell you, they're a good ass, they was a good ass football player. All I care about is if you do your job. You do your job, I do my job, we win, and we good. Every level you go to, it gets a little bit more like that. Mm -hmm. Brotherhood part, hmm, it is, but it's not what people think like the brotherhood part is like. Right. But even in that, like me and my sister argue like cats and dogs. I can argue with my sister. You can't call it a little cross-eyed fat joker or whatever I want to say that. You better not call my sister a cross-eyed fat joker, though, know, because I'm going to whoop your ass if you say that to my sister. Same thing. He can say Malik Jackson is, ain't worth that $90 million, but he is long, he knows he needs Malik to do a job. Somebody on the other side says something that's a little bit – and I think, the, again, I don't think – media is good. There are people who really do a very – Pete Prisco is one of them. Pete Prisco, I know for a fact. And Pete Prisco, matter of fact, Somebody put this to them. Send me the picture of Pete Frisco playing a sport in the 60s or whatever the fuck it is. Well, Pete Frisco's five. He fits in my pocket now. But he is really good at his job. I like yeah. this. Right. It don't have to be an athlete to do this. But I do know there is context. And the problem is people want more realness. They want more access. But they're, like, they can't ask for it. And then when you get it, oh, my God, puts my purpose. Cause I swear I have heard some things like y'all tell me all the time when they talk about Bobby. So what the hell do y'all think Bobby was? Y'all think Bobby was just around praying every day, carrying a rosary, and talking to Jesus? It's like you don't have the people that came through Florida State. Like we ain't submit to some soft ass person. Bobby was a goon. I tell people Bobby was a goon as much as I can tell them. Trust me. He just all stuff. It was that all stuff. Everything in front of y'all. And then if he needed to handle business, oof, the business was handled and swift. And callous, but he still was a great man. It's just that's just how things are done. Like people, people don't know what they don't. But those type of people is hard for fans to root for. That's what it comes down to. This ain't this ain't this ain't got nothing to do with the teams. If you want, if you only want the team to succeed because they have guys who you can personally root for, then you don't want the team to succeed. Just say that. Like at the end of the day, <laughs> nearly all of the best athletes that I've ever played with or had the you know, you know had the blessing to be able to come and you know come in contact with or compete against are guys who I probably I couldn't stand in real life like in in real life like outside of that field but the, outside of that field don't matter man this is a job and then when it's a job and when this uh, this is what my paycheck and my livelihood depend on I want the best dude who's going to do the work like forget all that other stuff we can talk about that later but just give me the dolls and we're going to figure the rest out so if, you, if your fan base is trying to push all the dogs out the door because they don't like the way they bite, but then I'm sorry. Then you're going to have a sorry team that's just nice. But here's, what, here's, the, here's the thing that bothers me about them trying to push those dogs out the door. Because the dogs say they sorry and they suck. But guess what the fans say all week? They're sorry and they suck. But when the person who actually works in the building says it, all of a sudden you're wrong or you got to go or you're causing a problem. Like I, I just I, I I just I just don't get it and I don't under, I don't know how like a guy like Yannick Ngakwe they say he tried to fight everybody in the building. Okay. Yeah, you know what? I try to fight everybody in the building too if I know I'm better than that joker in front of me and the only reason he's playing because he was the third overall pick. That's the first thing. The second thing is I'll try to fight everybody too because in a game where I'm still that's real competitive, you keep inserting Taven Bryan in the game, taking me, Calais, and Malik Jackson out of the game and wonder why I'm blowing up over here on the sideline. Hmm. It's because you're not trying to win. You're trying to fit your agenda and cover your own you-know-what. And players arguing it, fans arguing it, players don't understand. The players are the ones that had your back. They're trying to win the game. These dudes, even though they're making their money, they want to win. They don't want to keep losing and, and having that feeling. But when the team keeps doing stuff behind their back, behind their right. back, the right. team keeps doing stuff. Players have more access. Players have more understanding. Players know what's going on way more than we do. And for whatever reason, we 
because we're fans of the team before we're fans, fans of the player. We're always going to side with management, even when it don't make sense. And it's illogical, and we have to be able to own that. We all have worked for people that we thought were idiots. And that's the funny part. Like, the fans know. You get mad, you want to fight your employees, because, not your employees, your, your fellow um, workers, because, you know, your boss puts you in a bad situation or there's a there's an employee that the boss always shows favoritism. I hear it all the time when people who actually have jobs talk about this stuff. That's why I don't understand why they, the sports is a microcosm of society. That being said, I don't want to, I don't care if they're a good person. I don't want good people on my football team. You know what I want? I want guys that are, that if football wasn't there, I don't know what they would be doing. I want people, like I had teammates that I was so grateful that God invented this beautifully violent game so that they're not there to rob us. Like that's what I want on the team. Um, who was the big, he was the right tackle for us from Ole Miss, played basketball, very angry person. J Jeremy Parnell. Jeremy Parnell is one of the meanest people I've ever met in my life. <laughs> I love Jeremy Parnell. Jeremy Parnell came and I had to train his son. He was so angry. Like he wanted to beat his son for wanting to be a quarterback. He was like, look at me, son. You know, you ain't no quarterback. And it was funny. I popped him on Denny. I said, oh, man, I trained him. Oh, you want him to be quarterback? Hey, man, meet Denny. And he came in. It, Jeremy Parnell had a dingy wife beater with that little strap that's kind of broken off a little bit so it wasn't fully connected. He had on some and one shorts, some Dollar Tree flip flops, and he was ashy. Anybody who walks into a room like that is does not care about your life or his. He's ready to fuck everybody, and I need that. That's what I need. I don't care if you go to church every day. That's fine. Even if you believe in the Bible, right? You go read it. Look at David's my favorite person in that book. David had some mighty men. Go read that, and then you change your whole spirit. David had about fifty goons that was ready to do whatever they needed to do. That's what I need on a football team. I don't need right. to get. Tim Tebow didn't get cut because he loved Jesus. He got cut because he wasn't good. Hey, hey, man. Care about that stuff. You're right. And, and Game of Thrones is one of my favorite shows, except the second half of that bootleg last season. But yeah. still, they stepped on that, didn't they, James? But um, still, you know what happened? The people who was on one side of the wall got with the other people that them people that was out there you know the white walkers or whoever mm -hmm. they was i don't know who i can't remember the name of them but they got with those people with the giants and they say we got another enemy and we got to take care of right now oh yeah they got with the wildlings and the wildlings, the wildlings, wildlings right right you know what? We, we, we got to beat them i know we hate each other but we got to beat them right now and even from a political standpoint which i i hate really talking about politics especially being a barber but i never see any of um Nick Bosa's black teammates not dap him up when he gets a sack because he votes differently or he may voice certain opinions. And I never see him not dap them up because when you are a gladiator and you have a job to do, you do your job. It, fans ain't gonna matter who people vote for, who they get along with, who they hang with. Nobody gives a rat's you know what about none of that when it comes down to football and winning. So I, that's why I want fans, and I know I'm beating a dead horse when I say this, stop worrying about whether you like a dude or not because of his personality. And then saying, well, he trashed on the organization. The organization didn't need nobody to piss trash on them. They were trash when they left here, before they got here and when they left. And y'all yeah. say it every single week, but yet and still a person that works in the building can't say it. That's the, that's the weirdest thing to me. I want bad people with that, that have intentions of winning. Like, that's it. I don't really care. Like, again, if you're good and you can do that, great. Right. At the end of the day, it's about football. It's about winning. It's about expectations. Like, Because, again, it's a lot of good people that get cut because they couldn't do their job. Right. And as far as that stuff, again, and also the other, side, the other part of it is we really don't know. Unless you know these people, you really don't know them unless you get to hang out. So, like, my thing with Malik Jackson. I love him. If people knew about Malik Jackson and how cool he was off the field, you would have never wanted him to leave. No. Um, if you knew about Calais, if you knew what well, people like Calais, Calais was one of the good guys that could, that could ball. Um, again, Jalen, I don't think this is my thing when we both have him. I love, you know why I like Mayor Curry? Mayor Curry treats my son really good. Yep. It's hard for me to dislike somebody who treats my son good. Like, it's just, like oh, I can want to say, man, fuck you and your policies. He's when, when they made that run, like Trey will my son is probably gonna be Republican for the rest of his life because 
you know where Trey was at that last the, the, the last home game that was basically our play in to the playoffs in the suite. He was in the suites because of Mayor Curry. And then, then the next week when we had the playoff game, we're sitting there, Trey's with me. I'm driving. He called. He's like, hey, man, this Trey, you got this Trey got tickets to the game. He's like, here, I got two tickets for you. I'm going to send it to you right now. So he's like, shit. Hell yeah, that's my guy. That's all he wanted to see. And it was two exciting-ass games, too. While I had to work, I couldn't go. I was out there doing the First Coast News stuff. But the point in all of that is, is that right now we just need some badasses. And, and, and we need some things to come together. And I know we've been on here for an hour and 15 minutes, and I appreciate you guys' time. Um, but, you know, they got to put it together. It's not far off, but, man, there is reason to be concerned. But if they draft decently, especially in these middle rounds, there may be um, a silver lining to all of this because at the end of the day, games got to get played. It doesn't matter how good the roster looks. You got to go on there and you got to affect the play. Well, man, I appreciate y'all having me. You having me on James Sports Day, and I've been a fan from day one. And uh, you took it, you took off, man, and I love it. I love what you did for yourself. I love you, what you've done on the college side uh, with our with the advice you gave my our friend C.J. Wilson. I talked to Denny two weeks ago. He finally answered the phone, and I told him if he if you don't answer that phone, I told him I was gonna come break his legs if he didn't answer the phone finally. But he finally picked him up, and we had a one-hour conversation about all of this stuff, man. And uh, it's just so good to see new faces in the media. Uh, Demetrius is doing a really, really good job. Like Demetrius Harvey, yeah, man, it's it's good to see uh, so many faces. And and I take that thing you said real seriously about walking before other people could crawl or whatever. But then my goal was to see everybody surpass what I did. And because if y'all surpass me and that means you may be standing up on my shoulders because I'm standing up on somebody else's and my big brother in media was Frank Frangie. I'll tell anybody, Frank been on me for 20, 25 years. I called in high school scores to Frank when he was at the time junior. And just like he encouraged uh, people to do more for walking on charities, Frank gave me a little bit of a charge. You say, find somebody, we need your voices in the media. So everybody, and every time I get a chance, man, I do it. And this is white guys I like too. Shipley, I ain't like Cooper. I ain't. This ain't a Cooper DeJean moment now. I, but Shipley people too. Ship got a little brother that's um, uh, a student assistant at Florida State now too. That one of the first people that really supported me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ship got a little brother that's a student assistant at Florida State now too. That one of the first people that really supported a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, Griffiths, Gus Logue. There's a lot of people. Jamal. Alfie Crow for a long time. Me, and, yeah, Jamal. Me and Alfie used to go have some good battles, but Alfie was was another one. Uh, Dilla. All of these dudes, man, everybody that is, is putting out positive contributions. And a lot of people that still work at my old radio station. I'm still cool with Fat Tony, all of those dudes. Just I like the good content. What I don't like, I just, I just want us to, and I'll say this to anybody who I did mention, and I'm sorry. You got to take the fan side out of it. Because if that's what you're going to be and that's what you're going to do, man, is that's going to be short-lived. Because I'm going to tell you something. Those fans are going to turn on you too. Believe it or not, they're going to turn – they will turn on you so fast it's not even funny. The first time you say something that you're not supposed to. So why not just be authentic from the very beginning, man, and just call it what it is? One of the funniest things about fans – it was – yeah, I'll go back to the 2017 season. And I remember – and the lady got really mad at me. She, this is how I knew she was mad. She went and commented on her Facebook page and she sent the email to Griff. And she was just like, when it was after they took the knee in London. And they're like, they just lost fans from life. We have a whole section that's not going to come anymore because they took a knee and, and they hate America and this. And I said, let me ask you something. Like, and I, I was like, man, she texted me. I'm like, are you, are you serious? I said, the Jags have sucked ever since I've lived here. You're telling me that if the Jags make a run, you're not going to get it. I said, matter of fact, let me know where you're at right now. I will buy, those, I buy all those tickets from you. No, we want it to be empty so we can make a statement. Man, I went to that Seahawks game when, when, when the two um, the guys about to, whoop that, about to whoop that dude. They deserve a statue next to the Jaguar. They stood on business. Like, come in these stands, you're going to catch these hands. I was in the box with um, Jalen and his dad, with Jalen Rams. I love Jalen Rams. What was it? Lamont, Lamont, Lamont crazy. I try to tell old, yeah. he got an old black man name, and he is truly. Oh, yeah. Old, for those who don't know, Jalen, little brother, and Jalen, damn near identical. Yeah. I'm talking about the same, all that stuff. Their voices are not as high pitched and they're not as sassy when Lamont around. I feel like Lamont be like, I'm going to punch you in your chest if you don't deepen that voice a little bit. But we was up there and we saw everything, and it wasn't, it was standing room only. Then the playoffs happened, standing room only. 
the gift. There's only one thing about America that's the most, it's the most American thing in America. More than apple pie. America loves a winner. If you win, the fans won't be with you. And if you don't win, they're going to tell you how bad you are. Or so if your opinion's good, just make sure your opinion's good. If it sucks, you know, it is what it is. And I, Demetrius, I, I embarrassed Demetrius. I, I want to apologize for embarrassing him in Indianapolis. I can be unapologetically wherever I go. And I was walking out, you know, I'm, I'm with Sheena and I have a camera guy, Steve, with me. I see Demetrius. He's just over there. He's minding his own business, being very professional. Demetrius is very professional. I'm not. And I'm like, yo, Dave, what up, bro? I just scream in the middle of the convention center. And he's just like, so, man, it's me, James. Man, stop acting like that, man. These white people ain't going to bother you. Come on. <laughs> I went over there and dapped him up, man. Because he's my guy. So, people, tell them where they can find you, man. And I know you got your um, locked on pod today, so we can make sure we go support you. Yeah, Locked On Jaguars podcast. Wherever you get your podcast, it's free to subscribe to on our YouTube page. Just hit that bell so you get notifications when I drop an episode because sometimes I'm all over the place because of my schedule. But I do make sure that I drop one uh, Monday through Friday during the season to do a postcast on Sunday. And you can check, check me out on Locked On NFL every Friday also along with David Harrison, who is the host for uh, Locked On uh, Commanders. Um, Travis, appreciate you coming on, man, and dropping some knowledge, man. Um, tell us where we can follow you and where we can all make sure we get your content. Yes, sir. I appreciate you having me. Uh, no, uh, you can ca- you can find my writings covering the Jaguars on BigCatCountry.com. Uh, you can also find me on many different uh, you know podcasts throughout the week. But we have uh, the Duval Dive, a Jaguars podcast on Fridays at 1130 a.m., wherever you get your podcasts. Again, yep, yeah, absolutely. Click like and subscribe. Follow me. You can find me on Twitter, Travis D. Holmes, Facebook, Travis D. Holmes, Instagram, all the social. You know how that goes. Travis's IG is hilarious. Don't let the glasses and the polo shirt fool you. He is definitely got a sense of humor that is a little dark at times. It's great. I love it. Um, love T Wig. Appreciate you guys for coming on again. I'm at Big Game James underscore 36. And I just wanted to, we got a bunch of people in the comments saying, please do this more. Please do this more. I love having guys on. I wish um, Dilla would have called because, again, I think I'm the person that made everybody realize that Dilla, Dilla was white. I thought Dilla was, I thought Dilla was Eric Dunn. If no, I'll be honest with you, no, 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 no. Let me tell you what happened at practice. I think this was Urban's. This might have been Urban's first year. No, it wasn't Urban's first year because it was Urban. Yeah, it was because that we were in the end zone. Remember they changed it and we had to go. Mm-hmm. I was there and all of a sudden, dude walked to me and said, "What's up, man?" I turned around. Yeah. Big beard or red beard. I said, Yeah, what's happening, bro? What's going on? He said, It's me. I said, Who? He said, Dilla. I looked again. I said, Dude, I thought you was black all of these years. I, I did. I, I and I did not expect Dilla. he laughed, man. And we found that. So let me tell you something. You want to talk about a good guy, and you also mm-hmm. want about talk about a connected dude. And he's one of the quote unquote non-media guys, him and uh this guy Phil, who actually started the lockdown podcast with me after we took over with Zach. Jacksonville, whatever they say, lean lean on the side of believing it because they right. plugged in some kind of way. We had this thing when we used to yeah. say on sports, then if Dilla didn't say it, I don't believe it. That's right. Mm-hmm. When until Dilla confirms, it didn't it didn't happen that way. But when I saw him and I did during COVID, we were doing everybody didn't know what to do. So I'm like, man, I'm just throwing here, man. Put Dilla on that thing, and Dilla just came up and I said, Yo, yo, who the who are you? He's like, I'm need Dilla. I said, bro. I said, dog, I thought you was black, bro. I said, how are you playing? Like, I've seen him in the airport. Every time I know what he, I know he's not black. I know what he looks like. But every time I see him, it still shocks me. It's like it still throws me off. But um, I know Jeff Whitaker with dome hats. They got on um, the Dilla. They got E Dilla like the with the yeah. little mid, like fresh, fresh scoops. Fresh soups. Like for him. So but nah, man. Again, appreciate you guys. I'm gonna try to do some other stuff, man. Whenever you guys yes, can sir. come on, I much I greatly appreciate that, guys. Everybody, make sure you go follow um, my guy Wig. Go follow Travis. And again, um, what we got right now, y'all know. Once I get that six thousand subscribers, it doesn't matter if you're a college fan, pro fan, wrestling, whatever it is. We, once we get to six thousand subs, live on Big Games BS Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it's not thirty a.m. There'll be a five hundred dollar giveaway to a random person who's listening. Then members, there'll be a hundred dollar giveaway for members only, and then however many likes we have on the show. So right now we got a ton of y'all ignorant, um, uh, don't listen to nobody. Matter of fact, then there's four hundred of y'all on Twitter right now. Listen, 
If all 400 of y'all would have just took your ass over to YouTube and clicked the damn subscribe button, I could be giving away some money tomorrow. But y'all hard headed, don't listen to me. Just go over to the YouTube, click the damn button, you get your money by five. It's damn near direct deposit how quick you get it. But you'll get it um, and check that out. If we get to 10,000 subs before football season, I'm giving away a pair of season tickets to an FSU game, a Jazz game. As long as you're not a Gator, I'll probably even look into it for <laughs> Miami or something like that. But if you want tickets, I'll get you that. FSU, I know I got a pair of tickets as well as a parking pass to every one of those games. But, again, outside of all of that, appreciate you guys for chopping it up with us. We shall see you guys next time.